And maybe I'll just open in prayer and then, then we'll start. Yes, yes, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to meet together. I thank you for the privilege of being able to study. Lord, I pray that as we talk about these different um, uh, groups within um, the ancient world, I pray that it would not only be something that it's an intellectual endeavor, but Lord, that it would be something that would help us to understand the scriptures, that it would help us to understand the interactions that Jesus had with, with others, and Lord, maybe to even understand the opposition uh, that, he, that he faced. Father, I thank you for this time. Bless it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, I um, again, you can stop and ask questions uh, anytime you want. Oh, I have a couple more people here. Let's see. It's good. Okay. Good. Aha. Jane and Martin and uh, very good. So um, I want to talk today about the Sadducees, the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees um, are very different than the Pharisees. They are not the same. Um, the Pharisees were very popular among uh, the ordinary people, uh, and they were highly admired. Uh, but the Sadducees, well, the Sadducees, that's a whole different thing, because the Sadducees were... Um, they're the upper class. They were the they were the elite. They were they were wealthy. Uh, they were uh, aristocrats, and they lived um, mostly in Jerusalem. And they were the ones that controlled the temple. They everything that happened at the temple that was of any importance, it was the Sadducees who were in charge. So they were they were um, they were the priests at the temple. And they were, uh, as I said, very, very wealthy, and they are, they're the aristocrats of the society. They, they relied on the tithing practiced by the, the local people. And so that is another reason why the people, <laughs> as you can imagine, they despise them because they're taxing us, and they're, they're always wanting more money. And so the Sadducees are the aristocrats, uh, they taught and they administered uh, Judaism in, in Jerusalem. Uh, and um, whereas most of the, the priests that we read about in the New Testament, uh, they're just, they're, they're from the country. They're from small towns. Uh, they mm -hmm. taught in uh, the synagogues with, uh, within the small um, villages in, in Israel. So you have to distinguish between the, the priests and the, the priests at the temple. They're, they're not the same group. They, um, uh, so these, the priests who were uh, generally in these small villages would go to the temple to uh, do their, their duty, uh, usually in groups, and usually they would take turns. And they would perform the, the rituals that they were expected. And... Uh, uh, and they would consider that this a, a privilege and, a, and an honor. But there's a distinction between the, the priests and the, the, the Sadducees. Now, in the New Testament, when we read about the chief priests, the chief priests, the chief priests are always uh, Sadducees, not Pharisees, Sadducees. And the high priest, the high priest was... Uh, one of the chief priests, the, and he was a Sadducee. Now that's that's going to be really important. Um, so the chief priests and the high priest were Sadducees. They lived in uh, Jerusalem, and they administered the the things of the temple in Jerusalem. They had a lot of power. They yielded a lot of power uh, because they were the ones that controlled what happened at the temple. The temple was the absolute central uh, symbol for, uh, for Judea, or for Judah, in Judah, and also for uh, Judaism. It was absolutely central uh, to, um, to life. Uh, 
the temple was where the, um, the economic and the political power for the whole country was administered from. And so the Sadducees who lived in, uh, in Jerusalem, who uh, took care of the temple, they had incredible power and incredible um, oversight into the functioning of, uh, of the country. So the Sadducees were, as I mentioned, generally despised by uh, the rest of um, the people, which you can appreciate why. And uh, they deeply rejected uh, the ways of Jesus. Um, we, we, we tend to focus on the clashes between the Pharisees and Jesus, and, and that's, that's understandable. But I think we're going to see that Jesus clashed with the Sadducees all the time. Any clashes over the temple, especially in Jerusalem, he's clashing with the Sadducees, and, and we'll see uh, the reason why, why that is. Now, the, when we look at the history of the Sadducees, uh, scholars identify the Sadducees as uh, coming out of the Maccabean time. And after Judas Maccabee, we talked about him last week, um, there was a whole se a series of rulers called the Hasmoneans. Uh, Judas, Judas Maccabees was actually a Hasmonean. He came from that family. And um, during the... the uh, uh, the reign or the rule of the Hasmoneans, the Sadducees were like the counselors, were the counselors to the Hasmoneans. And they had a, a tremendous um, role to play in dictating how things should be, should be done. And um, so they, they had a, a prominent role within the political structures of of uh, uh, of Judah and Israel, right from uh, well from about uh, 100 and uh, 134 onwards, and so we see the scholars tell us that the the Sadducees emerged from that period. They were counselors to the the rulers. Now the the name Sadducee is a, probably a, a Hebrew form of a of a Greek word, and I, uh, I put the, the word there for you, the syndikio, uh, and over time, the, uh, the Hebrew word for Sadducees probably is in reference to, they saw themselves as being uh, righteous and, and separate, and so that's probably where the, the name Sadducee uh, comes from. Now, then the question is, so who were the Sadducees? Who were the Sadducees? Well, um, it's important to understand who they were so that we can appreciate why Jesus was in uh, conflict with them. So the high priest, uh, as I mentioned, the high priest was a Sadducee. They were all, he was always a Sadducee. And we read about the high priest in, um, you know, of course, in the scriptures. So from 6 AD until uh, for the next 35 years, um, the, there was direct uh, provincial authority um, given by Rome to appoint uh, governors. And as we saw last week, uh, it was actually even um, the emperor, emperor himself who, um, who appointed the, governor, the governors of Judea, Pontius Pilate being the famous one. And so from 6 AD for the next uh, 35 years, the provincial authority was established by Rome itself. And they appointed, now this is the important part. The, 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 Roman, the Roman government, a governor, so the Roman governor appointed and uh, deposed the high priest. So the high priest is the one who oversees the, um, the religious affairs of the temple, but you have the, the uh, Roman governor who is appointing the high priest 
and the, and uh, removing the high priest. So the high priest is under the uh, the domain or the authority of the Roman governor. Now you can imagine what kind of uh, issues that's going to create. But it's the Roman governor who appoints and deposes the high priest. Now that's going to be also highly, highly significant. Um, so as a member of the Sadducees, the high priest represented, he represented the Jews to the governor. So he was the, the spokesman, so to speak, for, for the Jews. And he was the one who interacted with uh, the Roman governor on behalf of the Jews. Now, uh, so he's responsible to not only represent uh, the Jews to uh, the governor, but he's also responsible for the general conduct of the people in the eyes of Rome. So that's why uh, during um, Passover, when Jesus rides into Jerusalem and the Sadducees get all uh, upset with what is occurring because there's a lot of turmoil and a possible um, uh, uh, rioting even perhaps, among the Jews, that's why the high priest is all upset because he's responsible for the, the general conduct of the people. And the, the last thing that you want is to uh, allow for uh, turbulence and um, uh, uh, people uh, uh, encouraging um, rebellion. If you're the high priest, you do not want to uh, cross the Roman governor because you are responsible for the general conduct of the people. So with all of this, you can appreciate how this puts the, uh, uh, the high priest uh, in a, a, a position that can be easily corrupted. And, and it was, it was corrupted. Um, he doesn't want to do anything to compromise his, his, his own position, and especially in the eyes of Rome. So this means that he doesn't want anything that's going to upset the status quo. Uh, we like things the way they are. We want things to continue the way they are, and we don't want anything that's going to upset um, the status quo. And so that's one of the major reasons why um, the high priest, uh, Caiaphas in, in this case, uh, is so opposed uh, to Jesus because he can see that this is going to uh, cause all kinds of upheaval, upheaval, and it is has the potential of creating a disturbance that Rome is not going to be pleased with. So you can appreciate how the, the, the high priest is under the authority of, of the governor, and he doesn't want to do anything that's going to compromise his position with the governor. And so he takes um, uh, great pains to make sure that everything is... Um, one of the things with the Romans, you can do whatever you want, but just don't cause any problems. Uh, any kind of a disturbance, we don't like disturbances. Uh, any kind of um, urging of uh, opposition, no, that's not allowed. And they would deal with it very harshly. And if there was any kind of uh, opposition, uh, the high priest is ultimately responsible. And so that uh, raises all kinds of, of issues. Um, and it certainly puts the high priest under the... Um, the domain of, of the governor. So um, with all that that I've just said, uh, are there any questions? Uh, any, any questions that you might have? Don't hesitate to ask questions. Questions are good. You, you won't offend me by asking questions. You can, not a bit. Any questions? No, oh, crystal clear, eh? Okay, <laughs> that's good. Well, Excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. 
No, when we, when we look at uh, the high priest being an appointee of the Roman governor. Yes. Yes. Does this mean that Israel had no authority of themselves or of their own? They did not appoint their own leaders? Uh, they did not appoint the high priest, no. Mm. They did not appoint the high priest. The, the Roman governor appointed the high priest. Yes. So, so, so the, uh, the, the, the people of Israel had no... Um, no say in who the high priest was going to be that was not their that was not their uh their prerogative uh it was the roman governor that appointed the high priest so you think of emily um the most uh senior religious official mm -hmm. in israel at the temple at the temple <laughs> and he's appointed by rome oh, by a roman governor you, you can appreciate the problems that that's going to create. Um, yes. He does not, the, the high priest does not want to cross Rome. You, mm. you, you do not want to cross Rome. You, you want to you appease Rome. You want everything to remain stable. Uh, not only because it's, uh, you want your own position to remain, <laughs> uh, because the Roman governors have had a history of they will appoint high priests and they will depose high priests. If you're not, if you're not doing what we want you to do, you're gone. You're gone. We'll, 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 we'll find another. And they did. And they did. They did. So, <laughs> I mean, there's all kinds of problems with that. And that's exactly what we see. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Good question. So the question. Now, was, does it mean, sir? Sure, that that question yes does it mean that originally according to the jewish traditional worship the office of the high priest was not there originally um well that's the good question martin if you go back into the old testament um who is supposed to be the high priest well from the line of aaron of aaron and who appoints the high priest well it, uh, it's God who is to appoint the high priest in the line of Aaron. But when we get to the New Testament, the Roman governor, they don't, they don't care what your line is. They don't care if you're a descendant of, uh, from the line of Aaron. That is, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We want a high priest that's going to um, uh, create stability. The Romans don't care about what you do at the temple. You can do whatever you want. We don't care about that. All we care about is uh, no problems. We want stability. If you want to carry out your religious practices, that's fine. But if you are going to incite uh, rebellion or turmoil uh, and anything that's going to uh, uh, call into question the stability of, of, of the country, yeah, we've got a problem with that. And and they know and Rome knows how to deal with troublemakers. You know what they do with troublemakers? They crucify them. That's what they do. They crucify them. Uh, we don't want troublemakers. And if you're the high priest, you don't want troublemakers either, because you are going to be responsible. And if there's trouble, you will give an account to the Roman governor. Uh, he'll be the first person, you will be the first person that he will tap on the shoulder, so to speak, and say, so, so what's happening in, in the city of Jerusalem? Uh, fix that. We don't want that. We don't want that. So that the good, that's a good question, though. Um, at this point, the, the, um, they're not overly concerned with... Um, whether the high priest is in the line of, of Aaron. That, that, that's that, that's uh, not really that, that pertinent. <laughs> that's good. Any other questions? Jane, any Question. questions at all? Any qu yeah. um, at, what, at what point, yes. at what point do we distinguish between the secular leadership and the spiritual 
like the, the the religious leadership when we talk about the 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 roman leadership that's a, yes that's a good question uh, what's the distinction between the the religious and the political at this point i would say that they are um they are so intermingled together the political and the religious and I would say that in the case of the Sadducees, I would say that the political um, uh, is more important than the religious. It's the political. Um, it's not that they didn't practice the religion at the temple with all the sacrifices and all those things, but it's the political that takes precedence. The, the political, for the Sadducees, for the Sadducees, the political is more important than the religious. They're, 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 um, and, you, and, and I think we can see that in, uh, well, we'll see that as we go on. But Jane, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, that's a very good question. The, the, when you have a, uh, a Roman governor appointing the most, uh, the highest religious official, at the temple to oversee the temple you've got a problem you've got a problem does Pilate care about uh the religious practices of the jews not a bit doesn't care does he care that there's political stability oh yeah oh yeah we want political stability so you can practice your religion all you want just don't cause any problems that's does that does that answer your question, Jean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Other questions, Martin? Do you have a question? No, no. not quite. Okay, okay. Well, we'll we'll go on then. And uh, when we look at uh, Annas and his family, now he is going to be a very uh, very important person here. Annas was the high priest. So he's a Sadducee. He's an aristocrat. Uh, he's extremely wealthy. And he comes from a very prominent, uh, he, is, he, he has a very prominent family. So he is the, the high priest from uh, 6th AD to 15 AD. He's the high priest. But even after 15 AD, uh, even though he's not technically the high priest he still has all kinds of influence because all of the high priests that were appointed uh after um after annas uh they're all related to him they're all related they're um five sons a one son-in-law and a grandson held the position of high priest they're all related to him and so <laughs> you can see the influence that he had. Uh, so his family was um, uh, very wealthy, very influential. And Annas retains a very significant role in uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. Now Caiaphas, which is his son-in-law, is the, the high priest. But, but behind Caiaphas, uh, we clearly see the influence of Annas. Uh, he's 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 there as well. He's there as well. Good to have you, John. Uh, John's just uh, uh, yeah. Maybe just turn your video on, John, if you could. That would be good. Aha! There you are. There you are. Good. Good. Uh, John, would uh, would you mind if I made you a, a, a host? So as as people yeah, it's come okay. in, yeah, okay, and that that would make it a lot easier for me. Uh, there, so that should make you a host, John, and and when people come in, I'll. Um, uh, you can let them in and 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 uh, do do that for me if you would. That would be great. Uh, I, I mentioned okay. that I am recording the the lecture here, so I will send the recording out to you as well. 
and that way you'll have the recording. So we're talking about Annas and his family. He's a high priest, he's a Sadducee, he's an aristocrat, and he's, a, he's very wealthy and very, very influential. So his son-in-law is Caiaphas. Yes, go ahead. And Caiaphas is um, the high priest from 1880 to 36. But during the time of Jesus, during his ministry, during the trial, during the crucifixion, who is the high priest? Caiaphas is the high priest. Now, he is... Um, he is the one who officiates at the, the trial and death of Jesus. And we know this from John chapter 11, uh, 49 to 50, uh, John 18, uh, 12 to 14. Uh, we, we know who was overseeing the, the trial of Jesus. It was Caiaphas. But as I mentioned, Annas uh, is, the, is his father-in-law, and, and he's... He's got his fingers in the pie, so to speak, as well. He, he's, in the, he's, he's in there as well. But Caiaphas is, is technically uh, the high priest. Now, it's interesting that even in the New Testament, even after uh, the time of, of um, the crucifixion and resurrection, uh, uh, Annas doesn't only have a role to play uh, during the trial and crucifixion of Jesus, he also has a role to play in the opposition to the apostles. So we're talking uh, the book of Acts. So after, after the resurrection, and as the church is birthed, and as the, the, the apostles um, go out and, and share the gospel, uh, there is opposition. And that opposition comes uh, primarily uh, from the Sadducees, and it is initiated by uh, Annas. We see that in Acts chapter four, verse six, for an example. Any questions about Annas? Any questions? No? Okay. Martin, any questions? No? Okay. Fight. All right, all right. Now, now we come to the chief priests. Now, the chief priests uh, as I mentioned, the high priest was chosen from among the chief priests. So we have to distinguish there's the high priest, that's one person, Caiaphas, for an example. But among, uh, but the high priest comes from the, uh, the chief priests. Now the chief priests, uh, they're also um, very wealthy. They also come from the aristocratic uh, uh, families who lived in Jerusalem. So you've got all these wealthy aristocratic families in Jerusalem, and the high priest comes from these aristocratic families, and so do all the chief priests as well. So all the chief priests um, come from these wealthy aristocratic families. The chief priests, they're the ones who administered um, all the affairs and all the the, the happenings uh, in the temple or at the temple, and so um, again, like the the high priest, maintaining the status quo is very important. Uh, if you were a chief priest, Emily, you would have a very com is good. <laughs> you you don't want anyone messing around with your position because it's actually you like. You like your position, and you like the influence and the and the power that you have. So let's just maintain the status quo. We don't want anyone coming in suggesting that there's anything wrong with the temple, because that's going to disrupt my position at the temple. And so um, uh, all the all the economic and political um, decisions and and uh, power resides at the temple. So all the economic and political influence for the rest of the country begins at the temple. 
So if you're one of the chief priests, you have you have the ability to influence all of the economic and political decisions and going ons uh, in in the country. That is a good position to have, <laughs> and, and you don't want anyone messing around with it. So when we look at the temple, all the important uh, officials that uh, administer uh, the t at the temple, they're all Sadducees, all of them. You, you got the, uh, the high priest, you got the chief priests, you got the treasurers of the temple. So all the people that control the money at the temple, yeah, they're Sadducees too. <laughs> and uh, all the principal um, offices of the temple and the captain of the temple guard. The temple had a, a group of soldiers. They're the guards. The, the one who is the captain, who is over all these guards, yeah, the, he's a Sadducee as well. So you got all the most important positions at the temple occupied by people who are Sadducees. Now you can imagine what kind of power and influence they had. Lots of it. Lots of it. Uh, and that's what brought them into conflict with, uh, with, with Jesus. Uh, they are the keepers of the temple. Uh, they are the keepers of the temple within the Jewish society. And they represent the wealthy and the politically powerful. So with all that background, it's not surprising that they, they objected to the message of Jesus. Um, especially when he uh, criticizes the temple uh, severely. And he's, he's advocating major changes to uh, the, uh, the Jewish life within, within that society. Uh, all the things that Jesus is talking about, all the changes that he's advocating for, uh, this is not good if you're a Sadducee. You do not want this. Uh, when Jesus goes, can you imagine if you were the, uh, one of these Sadducees and you administer the things of the temple and you've got this um, brash preacher from Galilee of, 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 of no less coming into the temple and throwing over the tables. Remember the story where Jesus goes in to the temple and he throws over the tables, and he's got a whip, and he's he's calling the, the temple uh, a, a den of thieves. Um, if you're a Sadducee, is that going to upset you? Of, of course. He's calling into question not only the temple, but he's calling into question you, because you're one of the keepers of the temple. Uh Whenever, you, whenever we read in the New Testament where there's any kind of a conflict uh, at the temple or with the temple, you can be almost certain that the conflict is with a Sadducee. Why? Because they're the keepers of the temple, that's why. And so we, we see that. Yeah, uh, it's not surprising that um, uh, they also oppose the apostles and led to the persecution against the apostles. We, See that in Acts 4, uh, 1 to 6, in Acts 5, uh, 17 to 18. Uh, Jesus, uh, uh, he denounces their corruption. Uh, he denounces their political compromise. And he's denouncing all that. that because it's all at the expense of uh, devotion to God. And his teaching, so this is the teaching of Jesus. The teaching of Jesus uh, challenges uh, their position at a fundamental level. And his teaching uh, directly challenges their core beliefs. So before we move on, is there any, any questions about anything that, um, that I've said? Any questions? Excuse me, sir. Yes. I'm about to find out. Uh, I've lost the right to host. Uh, there's somebody online. Oh, okay. Kindly help. Uh, 
yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll mm -hmm. I'll admit um, them, and then I'll I'll put you back. You should. Okay. Be, let's see here. Try that, John. Okay, thank you. That, that should reinstate you as the as the host. Yeah, it is. Any any questions about any of this so far? Now, let, let me let me ask. Yes. We are seeing the Sadducees being the the people who are taking care of the the, the temple. Yes. They were responsible for the tranquility and uh, and uh, stability of uh, the Jewish towards the yes. the Roman government. Yes. And previously, we also saw this also coming in through the Pharisees. Uh, they were taking care of the temple. They were guarding the temple. They oversaw the 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 restoration of the temple after defilement. Yes. So yes. how 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 were they clashing? How were their functions operational? The, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were not friends. They, they, they okay. had very different views, very different. <laughs> uh, the Pharisees okay. also treasured the, the temple, but they wanted, they wanted God to, um, uh, they wanted God to, to reform the temple. And they thought that God would reform the temple by being pure and holy and following the Sabbath and, and, and the food laws and all those things. It was not that the Pharisees didn't treasure the temple. They did, but they thought that, that, that God was going to um, act or intervene uh, at the temple, at the temple, if we would just follow the law. If we would follow the law, then God will act. So it's not, so they had a high view of the temple as well. The Sadducees, I don't think, I don't think they really had a high view of the temple. I think that they uh, they wanted to maintain the status quo of, of the temple. Okay. Uh, because it was politically expedient for them to, to do that. Uh, so they, they both saw the need to retain the temple, but, uh, but their, um, uh, the reasons for it, I think, are very different. Does that help, Emily? Does that help? Yes, 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 yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the Pharisees, they, they weren't political. Um, the Pharisees were, were very religious. They, they, they weren't interested in politics. They were interested in, uh, as long as you let us um, carry out our religious uh, practices, that's what we want. They were okay. political in in the same way, and so they were they're very different than than the Sadducees, and and with a few exceptions, with a few exceptions, uh, they weren't they weren't from the wealthy class. Now there was a few exceptions. Um, it would seem that Joseph of, of Arimathea, for an example, uh, was a Pharisee, and and he was he was obviously wealthy. So it's not that there weren't any wealthy Pharisees. But in general, uh, the Pharisees weren't the, uh, they weren't the aristocrats. They weren't the arist aristocrats. Okay. Thank good. you. That's a good question. Any other questions? Uh, not really a question, just an observation. Yes. Uh, from what I'm gathering, what you're saying is that uh, there was only one temple. Oh, yes. And oh, yes. Uh, the Pharisees were kind of in synagogues, which were scattered all over in other in the rural villages and a few cities. But the temple, there was only one temple and this is where the Sadducees had concentrated because this is where there was the high priest and the chief priest. The chief Am priest. I right or wrong? Uh, uh, absolutely, uh, Armstrong, absolutely. You have one temple and, and for the Jew, I mean, the temple is everything. It's, this is the central uh, symbol of our entire, not of our entire nation, because the temple is where the presence of God is. This is where we meet with the presence of God. So in the New Testament, when you read about the synagogues, <clears throat> synagogues are different. 
Synagogues were in uh, just about every uh, small village, you would have a synagogue. The synagogue, there was no, you, you didn't offer sacrifices at the synagogue. Animal sacrifices were offered at the temple, not the synagogue. At the synagogue, the synagogue was sort of like the local, um, it, was, it was sort of like the, the, the church and the school and the, uh, the uh, administrative um, center of the community all rolled into one. Uh, they would meet on the Sabbath, of course, for uh, reading of the, of the scriptures and worship. Um, the synagogues were also uh, like a school for, ch for children. That's where you went. That's where you went to school, uh, and all the important um, decisions and the administration of uh, uh, for the the community would would occur at the synagogue. So, uh, absolutely, Armstrong, it, it it it's really important to distinguish between the synagogue and the temple. There's one temple, and where is it located? It's in Jerusalem. Uh, but there are many synagogues. So there's a, I mean, in, in, um, <clears throat> uh, in, in uh, Luke chapter 4, we read about Jesus going to the synagogue in Nazareth. Well, yeah, uh, he would have went to the synagogue as, as a young boy. He's going, he's going back home. And, and he's, of course, that, that's, a, that's a famous passage where he's reading from the, the prophet Isaiah. Uh, but Yes, it's, a, it's important to distinguish between the temple and, and the synagogues. The temple was, uh, from what I, I've never, I, obviously I've never seen it, but um, the temple, I mean, when you're entering into Jerusalem, you can't miss the temple. It's on a, it's on a mountain, what they would call a mountain, uh, Mount Zion, this huge building. And it's, it's prominent. That's what you're going to see. That is the place where the Jews believed that the presence of God could be uh, experienced. That's where the presence of God is. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Uh, is, does that help, uh, Armstrong? Yeah. Okay, so... When we start to look at the beliefs of the Sadducees, well, that's um, that's interesting too, and you can you will see why they came into conflict with Jesus. You think of all the things that Jesus emphasized, and then you, you consider what the Sadducees believed, and it is not surprising that they clashed with Jesus. So. The beliefs of the Sadducees put them at odds not only with the Pharisees, so we talked about that, uh, Emily, that their, their, their beliefs were very different than, Sad, than the Pharisees. But of course, it also put them at odds with Jesus. Uh, now, this is because, um, for, one re for one thing, they, they rejected any notion of angels or demons. Uh, that's, that's not on. They, they, don't, they don't believe in that. Of course, we see Jesus... Uh, uh, clashing with, with the 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 supreme demon, uh, i.e., uh, Satan. But the Sadducees don't believe in angels. They don't believe in demons. Uh, and and this is the important part: they only believe in the Torah, the written Torah. So the five books of Moses, they believe in the Torah, the written Torah. The rest of the Old Testament, no, they don't believe in that. They they so they don't believe in the prophets. They don't believe in uh, the wisdom literature, they only believe in the written Torah. Now that is going to be, uh, they're definitely going to clash over that one. So the written Torah is the only thing that they uh, ascribe to. Uh, they, so last week I talked about how the Pharisees appealed to the oral traditions and the traditions of the elders, for an example. The Sadducees, uh, they don't believe any of that. Uh, that 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 has no bearing on what we should do. So um, they they don't um, they don't appeal to the traditions or the oral traditions of the previous generations. That's uh, that's something that the Pharisees ascribe to, not the Sadducees. Uh, the Pharisees wanted God to reform Israel. In contrast, uh, the Sadducees they want to maintain the status quo of Israel and their their privileged position. 
that they enjoyed at, uh, within the country and at the temple. And, uh, and they wanted to remain, it, it, to remain that way. Uh, so even though the country was governed under the thumb of Rome, that the people despised, for the Sadducees, we're okay with that because life is good. And let's just maintain uh, the status quo. Um, so the ordinary people, as I mentioned, they, they, they hated the Sadducees almost as much as they hated the Romans. But um, because of their privileged life under, under the Romans, uh, it's not surprising that the, that the Sadducees would not welcome the message of the Old Testament prophets. Now, when you read the Old Testament prophets, um, it's pretty clear that the prophets, who did they speak against? Well, they spoke against the leaders within the society. The Old Testament prophets uh, speak about the, the leaders, the, the corruption of the leaders, and they warned of uh, God's um, coming judgment. If you're a Sadducee, you don't want to hear any of that. Um, and any message of, of, uh, uh, of warning of God's judgment or corruption, you don't want to hear that. So it's not surprising that they would reject uh, the message of the prophets. We only want to um, follow the Torah. The prophets, no, we don't want that. Um, the Sadducees dismissed the, the message of, of the prophets. Uh, that doesn't pertain in their mind. Uh, they also didn't want any kind of uh, anything that was going to encourage uh, revolutionary activities. No, we don't want that either. Again, because of the status quo. Uh, because that would uh, seriously disrupt their relationship with, with Rome. So you can see why they would uh, dismiss the message of the prophets and why they would not want to have any kind of activity that would incite um, any kind of revolution or rebellion uh, against Rome. So they only believed in the written Torah. They also only believed in free will. Uh, is God sovereign? No, God, God, God doesn't care about um, intervening uh, in our lives. We believe only in free will, uh, the Sadducees would maintain. Um, they rejected any notion that God would interfere or intervene uh, in or direct the affairs of people. That's, that's highly significant. In other words, God leaves life and how we live life uh, mainly up to us. We determine how we live. The Sadducees' idea of free will uh, will have had little to do with, it wasn't that they had some kind of abstract uh, philosophical ideas of free will that they're trying to maintain and, and promote. It wasn't, it wasn't abstract philosophical reasons for maintaining uh, free will. It was all about political power. Uh, after all, God, uh, Israel's God, uh, if you were to ask them, they would say, well, God helps those who help themselves. Now, I don't know if you've, if you've heard that expression in, uh, in your context. I hear it in my context all the time. God helps those who help themselves. Well, if, if you think that God helps those who help themselves, then we have no need for God to intervene because we can do it ourselves, quite frankly. We will make the decisions for ourselves. That was how the Sadducees viewed life. They, they embraced this free will only because they could continue to maintain uh, the things that they had. We, we don't believe that God intervenes. In fact, we don't want God to intervene. Uh, God leaves all of the decisions up to us. And we are making the decisions as we speak in light of uh, what we deem to be uh, important <laughs> for maintaining our position. So Dr. Wright, in one of his books, he says, this is a, a comfortable doctrine to have for those who are in power. If you're in power, you don't want God to intervene. Let's just keep things the way they are. Um, 
he says this is a comfortable doctrine to have for those who are in power and who retain that power and influence by any means possible. Of course. Now, in contrast, those who don't have power. So the, the Pharisees didn't have a lot of political power. Uh, for those who don't have power, they're more eager to see uh, and, and to desire a God to intervene and change things. The Pharisees wanted God to change things. The Sadducees, no, we don't want God to change things because we like things just the way they are. Um, the Pharisees tried to hasten this change by, uh, by following the Torah, by keeping the, uh, the purity laws and, and the Sabbath and, 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 uh, and all the things that we talked about last week. And so they invited God to reform Israel. Others, like the uh, Essenes that we're going to talk about uh, in, in a moment, they, they didn't have any political power either. They wanted God to intervene as well but um, and change things. But for the Essenes, they waited without trying to hasten uh, God's intervention. They, they saw God intervening, uh, in their case, without any kind of, um, uh, any kind of their own efforts involved. And so both, as we will see, both the Pharisees and the Essenes wanted God to intervene. The Pharisees thought that God would intervene through them, uh, their efforts at keeping uh, the law. The Essenes said, no, no, God's going to intervene, not because of our efforts, but we will just wait uh, and, and, and for God to, uh, to act. So we'll see what the, the differences are in uh, next, next, next hour. But um, now this next thing that they denied is, of course, highly significant. They did not believe in the resurrection. There is no resurrection. There will, there has, there will be no, there's no need for a res resurrection. Now, that obviously puts him in conflict with Jesus. Uh, did Jesus talk about the resurrection yeah, all the time? Did Jesus, uh, was he resurrected? Well, of course. Uh, they were in uh, direct conflict with Jesus over the issue of resurrection. The Sadducees had no notion or desire to uh, hold to any form of resurrection. Uh, in the first century, the idea of resurrection at the end of time, and we'll, we'll see that in, uh, in, in a little while, the idea of resurrection at the end of time, along with being a hope for and uh, a symbol and, and a, and a it almost became a metaphor for the total reconstitution of, of Israel. The Sadducees, no, 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 no. We, we don't need that. We don't need that. They rejected resurrection. Uh, the resurrection that the Pharisees wanted was to uh, reestablish a theocratic uh, Israel where God was the one who was, was in control. Uh, under possibly the rule of a coming Messiah. For the Sadducees, no, no, we don't need that. In fact, we don't want that. We don't believe in any form of resurrection, and that is just, to them, uh, nonsense. Now, any form of, any longing for a resurrection, you see, would, would disrupt <laughs> and put an end to the power that they had. Life is good. We like our position. We don't want any kind of resurrection where God is going to intervene and change things. Why would we want that? Let's just maintain what we have. They had, um, so they didn't have any desire for any, any talk of, uh, of an afterlife. Uh, that was something that they didn't uh, see was uh, deemed to be important. Uh, denying the importance of the resurrection certainly puts them at odds with Jesus. And it puts them at odds with what Jesus said would happen. And it clearly puts them at odds with what did happen. So 
it's not surprising that the Sadducees would oppose the message of the early church. Um, if you have a group of apostles trying to convince people, you know, there was this man and he was crucified on a cross. And on the third day, he rose again and he's resurrected. He's alive even as we speak. If that's the message of the apostles, and of course it was, it's not surprising that the Sadducees opposed that message. And they did. Uh, they were at odds with anything that would uh, suggest <clears throat> that there was an empty tomb. They don't believe in empty tombs. They don't believe in resurrection. And Jesus talked about, he, he came to establish the kingdom of God. And he came to establish the kingdom of God that would extend into um, someday a complete culmination of the kingdom of God. And that was what he promised. They don't want any uh, future kingdom of God because that would suggest they're, they're, uh, there's something wrong with the present um, structure of our society now. They rejected that. Any hope in a re resurrection is not the message of those who are, who are in power welcome. That's, that's the point. Uh, the resurrection is the hope of those who have no power and who long for God to intervene and make everything right. The Sadducees, they liked the rightness of their wealthy, powerful positions and, and influences within the Jewish society. Therefore, they rejected any changes to that position, such as advocated in the idea of the resurrection. So when Jesus was in Galilee, his clashes were mainly with the Pharisees. When he went to Jerusalem, he, his clashes included also the wealthy, uh, corrupt, status quo keeping Sadducees. Their, their desire to cling to power and maintain the status quo of the temple put them at odds and out of sync with God's appointed Messiah who inaugurated or, or began the kingdom of God. And the promise of that kingdom uh, culminating completely in the future with a complete and life-changing implications was something that the Sadducees opposed. They not only opposed Jesus, but they also opposed the preaching of the apostles after the resurrection of Jesus. The alliance of the Sadducees with, with Rome was the, was the part uh, that the ordinary people uh, hated. And so did Jesus, along with the corruption of the temple. Jesus despised the political uh, power, uh, corruption uh, that the Sadducees uh, practiced. And so with a party so tied to maintaining the status quo of the, of the temple, it's not surprising that they ceased to exist after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So in 70 AD, the Romans, they've had it with the Jews. And in 70 AD, they come in and they absolutely destroy Jerusalem and the temple. There is no temple in Jerusalem as we speak. The Romans crushed the temple in 70 AD. And uh, not only did they uh, crush the temple, but the Sadducees ceased to exist as a party because they were so tied to maintaining that temple. Uh, their commitment to maintaining the status quo of the temple put them at odds with their fellow countrymen and made them expendable to the Romans, as well as experiencing the judgment of God that Jesus declared would happen against the temple and their ways. And of course, that's exactly uh, what happened. So that gives you a little bit of, a, of an understanding, of, hopefully, of who the Sadducees were, uh, what they did. 
what they believed and why they clashed with with Jesus. I would say that whenever we read in the New Testament of Jesus clashing over issues of the temple, invariably they are tied, especially in Jerusalem, uh, to uh, to the Sadducees. Not not always, but often. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. And is there any questions about anything that I've I've said? Any questions at all? Crystal clear? <laughs> no? All right. Just, any questions at all? I don't want to go on in the, if there's questions. Uh, I wanted just some clarification. Sure. We, we have a group of people who are called the synagogue rulers. Where, where were they from? A, a good example is uh, uh, the Jairus, you know, it, it was a synagogue ruler. Where yeah. were these people falling in this category? Yes, the synagogue rulers, uh, they're probably going to be uh, Pharisees. They're going to be people that are uh, ruling over the local synagogue. Uh, they're probably not, they're, they're, they're not Sadducees. The Sadducees were uh, located mm -hmm. mostly in, in Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, within, within a local town, say like Capernaum or Nazareth, uh, did, did, the, mm -hmm. did the synagogue play an important role? Oh, yeah. Very important. Very important. Within those, within those towns, but, mm -hmm. but they would still, um, they would still look to, to Jerusalem and the temple as the place to be. Uh, so, uh, uh, Joseph, that if you were if you were a, a priest in, let's say in Capernaum, and you have an opportunity maybe once a year to go up to the to Jerusalem, and perform your uh, religious duties at the temple. Well, that's an honor. That's an honor. You, you prize that because you, you cherish the temple. But, but that's different than, than a Sadducee. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Does that help? Thank Does that you. help? I mean, there are a few uh, wealthy Pharisees in the New Testament, but by and large, the, uh, the, 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 the local priest at the local synagogue they're not wealthy they're not wealthy now they might have they might have influence in that town well because they're the priest but in terms of being wealthy no they're not wealthy they're they're well, there's going to be a few exceptions but generally speaking they're not wealthy uh, but they do have influence so yeah. any other questions no? Crystal clear. All right. <laughs> any, any at all? No? All right. Well, um, with that, we can go on and talk about the, uh, there's another group called the- Five minutes, five minutes break. Sure. Do you want a break? <laughs> Yeah, okay. See, we can go for a short call. <laughs> yeah, okay. How, how will we take a five minute break? Well, yes, please. Okay, all right. Fair enough. I'll take a break as well. So I'll be right back. Break it 
So, talk about Okay, so we'll talk about the, uh, before I move on, any questions from what we were talking about with the Sadducees? Okay. Well maybe we'll we'll get started. I want to talk about the a group called the Essenes. The Essenes. Now, uh, this is a little bit different because, of course, in the New Testament we read a lot about the Sadducees and the Pharisees. In the New Testament, though, we don't actually um, uh, come across this group called the Essenes. The Essenes. They're not mentioned in the New Testament. However. They were a sect in the true sense. Uh, they, for example, they, they were very isolated. They isolated themselves from the rest of Israel, both geographically and uh, theologically. Some of, them, some of them lived in the southwest uh, quarter of Jerusalem, but there was another uh, group that lived in Qumran. <clears throat> now, maybe you've heard of Qumran. Qumran is where um, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. <laughs> yeah, this is very, <clears throat> very, very famous. Qumran is on the northwest shore of uh, the Dead Sea. And the Essenes lived almost like monks, like a uh, monastic community or monastic uh, yeah, monastic community. <clears throat> they they lived almost like a monastic life in uh, an area called Qumran, uh, which is on the northwest shores of the Dead Sea. So, I hopefully you you could see the picture that I tried to uh, provide for you. <clears throat> you can see the Dead Sea. Right up in the the corner is the Qumran. Now we're not talking that far from Jerusalem here. Um, I've never been to Israel, but uh, the drive from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea, it, we're, we're talking less than two hours. Less than two hours, drive, drive. So it's not that far, but it is in the scriptures talk about the wilderness, but will, it's not wilderness in the sense like a, like a forest. It's wilderness like, like a desert, like a desert. And it is a, it's dry, 
and it's a desert. And there was a community that lived there called the Essenes. And there, I gave you another picture. It's a picture of, of Qumran. And you can see how, uh, how dry it is. Uh, it, it's, it's near, it's, you can see the Dead Sea. Uh, it's very close to the Dead Sea, which of course is the lowest point uh, on earth, the Dead Sea. So we're talking very dry, desert-like um, uh, uh, context. And of course, it's here that they found the famous Dead Sea Scrolls. Have, have you heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls? The Dead Sea Scrolls are very, very famous. They were, uh, they found, they were discovered in uh, 1948, 1948. And the, the story behind the Dead, Seas is, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls is very famous. There was, a, there was a little shepherd boy. He was out looking after his sheep and he was bored. And so he, there were some, some openings in the caves and in his boredom, he had some rocks and he was throwing the rocks up into the caves and he throws the rocks up into the, uh, a rock up into the cave and he hears it, hears it hit something. And it sounded kind of strange. So he thought, what in the world is that? And so he climbs up and he looks in the cave and he discovers these very, very old pots. And inside the pots are these ancient scrolls. And they have, they're dated from before the time of Jesus. And of course, these become very, very famous. They're called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, there is there is practically or very little moisture in that area. That's why they they were preserved in the way that they were. Uh, and scholars have begun to uh, try to study and understand the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And from the scrolls, we get to understand this group called the Essenes. They were probably uh, the ones who hid the scrolls in in the caves. Um, and scholars compare what these documents that they've discovered, they compare them with what some of the ancient writers uh, say about um, the Essenes. Uh, ancient writers like Josephus and Philo of Alexandria and uh, Pliny the Elder, they are ancient writers that speak of the Essenes. And so scholars can take what uh, these ancient writers say and they can compare them with uh, with some of these scrolls that they found. Now, some of the scrolls that they found were their own writings, but of course there was also, um, I think it's almost a complete um, uh, document of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, that's really significant. Uh, someone put a copy of Isaiah in one of these pots, and uh, hid them in the uh, the cave. This these this document of Isaiah is before the time of Jesus. So did Isaiah uh, make reference to to Jesus uh, before Jesus uh, was born in Bethlehem? Of course, and the the scrolls uh, point us in that direction. So I gave you another picture there that you can see the caves. Um, the, they, they look desolate. Um, you know, there, there's, uh, there's, there, see those holes? That's where they, they found the scrolls. So true to the thinking of a sect, the Essenes claim to be the true heirs of the promises of scripture. And they consider all other devout um, people and other devout Jews as dangerous and deceived. So typical of a, of a sect. We are the only ones who are practicing the truth. Uh, we are the only ones who are devout. Um, all the other people that you, you mention or can name, including other Jews, yeah, they're not devout at all. They are dangerous and they are deceived. And we need to uh, remain isolated from them. Uh, that's typical of a sect. In contrast, 
Uh, they consider themselves to be exclusively the sons of light. They actually use that phrase, sons of light. We are the sons of light, and everyone else, they are the sons of darkness. So if you're not part of our group, if you don't think the way we think and believe the way we believe, well, you are a son of darkness. We are the sons of light. And so you can see um, how uh, much of a sect they were. Any questions about that before I go on? Any questions? No? All right. Now we look at the history of the Essenes. Now scholars trace their formation of the Essenes back to the period of opposition to the Hasmoneans. We've, we've mentioned the Hasmoneans before. Uh, Judas, of Mac, Judas Maccabees came, uh, was a Hasmonean and those who followed Judas Maccabees were also Hasmoneans and they were the ones who ruled over, um, uh, over Israel. Now, there were some who had a real problem with the Hasmoneans. And they, um, in around uh, 150 B, 152 uh, BC, uh, the Hasmoneans put together in one person a, the priest and the king. So in one person, one person is both the priest and the king. And there was a group that had a real problem with that. Uh, they thought that that was something that was forbidden and not allowed. And they become this group called the Essenes. You, in their opinion, in their mind, you cannot have one person who's both a priest and the king. That is a recipe for disaster, and it's something that is forbidden, and they, they were opposed to that. So they, as a result of that, because they were so um, opposed to the uh, the temple and the uh, the, the uh, structure at the temple with having one person, both king and priest, we don't want that. So what we'll, we will do, we will withdraw from um, that area and they go into the wilderness, i.e. Qumran, and that's where they're going to live because we're not going to have anything to do with the temple. It's corrupt and we are, we are opposed to uh, the, the priest and the, um, uh, the, the, the influence of the priest as well. So they withdraw within into the wilderness, which is, as I mentioned, wilderness, don't think forest. Wilderness is desert. They withdraw into the desert and they are under the leadership of his, he, he was referred to as the teacher of righteousness. Now, now when you think of how that um, contrasts with, with Jesus, that is, that's quite a title. This is before Jesus. This is before Bethlehem. And so you have a leader who is referred to as the teacher of righteousness. And he sets forth, this is what we're going to believe. Sorry about that, I'm not sure what happened. So we have um, this teacher of righteousness. This is before the time of Jesus. And his interpretation of the scriptures is not to be questioned. So Emily, if you were among this community of Qumran and the teacher of righteousness says, this is how you are to understand the scriptures, there is no deviating from that. Uh, his interpretation is the right interpretation. And his rules of how to live, yeah, you're going to obey them strictly. There's no, there's no uh, discussion about this. It's very, very strict. And um, uh, the scenes remained there. They remained in Qumran until 68 AD. Uh, not surprising, that's right around the time of the Romans coming in and crushing Jerusalem and, and the temple. And they go out into the desert and they also... Um, a deal with the Essenes. So, so any questions about that so far? No? Okay. 
This a scene where neither the Pharisees nor the Sadducees, they didn't belong to the both side no. of... Uh, uh -huh. a, a, a separate group, separate group. Okay. They would have, they would have some, some affinity with the Pharisees in terms of strict uh, dietary rules and purity rules, but their understanding of, uh, of how to uh, live was very different. They withdrew from society. The Pharisees didn't withdraw from society. They're, they're trying to change society. Mm -hmm. The scene said, no, no, no. Uh, we are going to withdraw from society, and we're waiting for God to intervene, but he's not going to intervene because of anything that we do. We're just going to wait for him to intervene. Okay. Of course, they thought that he was going to intervene through them. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. So... So uh, now, <laughs> go ahead. Any? Would we assume that uh, their kind of belief was not very significant? That is why it was not captured in the New Testament. Yes. Uh, the auth authenticity of the New Testament. I, I think so. I think so. I, I think that um, during the during the period of the New Testament. Uh, well, I, I need to be more specific. During the time of the life of Jesus, during the life of Jesus, I don't think that they had a great deal of influence in terms of, of, of the society. And so um, that's why I think there isn't a lot of, there isn't any mention of them in the New Testament. Uh, however, some of their ideas uh, I, I think we're kind of the seeds for uh, some of the the some of the theology that we read about in the New Testament, although they're not mentioned in the New Testament. I don't know. Does that answer your question, Emily? Okay. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. They're they're not mentioned in the New Testament, but are some of their ideas? Uh, yeah, I, I think they were. Um, I think they, some of their ideas became uh, somewhat in, uh, important in um, how the New Testament writers understand things. But in terms of their influence on uh, the society, um, no, I don't think so. Uh, part of it is because they withdraw from society. Um, we, if, you're not one of, if you're not in the scene, uh, Emily, we don't want you in our community. And if you want to join our community, well, you're going to have to go through a, a, a major um, <laughs> uh, initiation. There's a long process to become a part of our community. They, they, don't, they don't want people in their community who are not like them. So you, I could see how people would not be, not everybody would be attracted to that. Now, um, so who were the Essenes? Well, the Essenes withdrew from society, as I mentioned, because they, they thought that the the uh, temple was corrupt, and they believed that God's favor rested upon their group, their group. So God's favor does not rest upon the Pharisees, and they don't rest. Up, they certainly don't rest upon the, the Sadducees. God's favor rests upon us. We are the favored group, and God's favor rests upon us. Uh, God's intervention had already begun. So they would. Say, well, this this is this is some of the seeds that I mentioned. Uh, God's intervention had already begun. And it had already begun in the practices and the hopes that they were seeking to live out. So they would say, is God starting to intervene? Oh, yes, he is. How? Well, through us. We are the ones that he's, he's intervening through. Um, as a result, they str stringently focused on strict purity laws and holiness as a group. And they held everything in common. Uh, isn't that fascinating? They hold everything in common. Uh, you don't. You don't have any private property or private things, uh, uh, Emily. You, no, no, we, we hold it in common. And so there, there, there was that sense as well. Now, there was some variety within, they weren't all, they weren't all the same. Um, scholars tell us that there were some varieties, uh, varieties within the various groups. But generally speaking, that the group that we call the Essenes, they mostly rejected marriage. For celibacy, we don't want to be married because we think that that is going to um, 
detract from our devotion to God. So they were all for celibacy, but they also adopted orphan children. So that's, that's interesting. They, they, they did have arms, like um, weapons, but they only used the weapons to protect themselves. They, um, uh, they didn't swear. Uh, they investigated uh, diseases and sought uh, medical remedies. Um, they also expelled members for committing offenses and uh, took them back before they starved. So you do something that's wrong, we're going to kick you out. Uh, we don't want to see you starve, though. So, I mean, we'll, we, we will have you come back in, but um, we don't want to see you starve, but we will expel you for not maintaining our, our practices. Now, what about the beliefs of the Essenes? Well, uh, consider the following highlights of their beliefs, and, and these these uh, both confirm them as a sect and what they hope for in the future. Now, this is, I, I find it uh, uh, interesting. They dismiss the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, the temple is corrupt. Uh, all the people who, who administer the, um, the affairs of the temple, they're corrupt as well. Uh, they consider the, the temple to be polluted, polluted. It's unclean. And God, of course, only works through uh, people and groups that are clean. The temple, the temple's polluted. It's unclean, and God is not. He He will not sanction um, the things going on at the temple because it's corrupt. Uh, they also have a community rule book, rule book, a community rule book, uh, and they they dismiss animal sacrifices. Now that's interesting. So they're in Qumran. They're in the desert. They're a long ways from the temple. They hold that they are the people of God, that God is working through and has begun to work through, but they don't practice any animal sacrifices. Uh, that is uh, significant because it shows that they, they dismiss the temple. Uh, the temple is where you uh, offer animal sacrifices. Uh, they, they didn't see any need for animal sacrifices, uh, which of course, as I mentioned, occurred at the temple. Now, the other thing that is uh, highly significant the Jews had begun returning from exile in 538 BC. Remember the story where um, they're allowed to go back to Jerusalem in 538. Uh, but, but, the Essenes would have said, well, yes, that's when the exile began. But it's not really happened. After all, uh, Israel remains unredeemed. So the exile might have started technically in 538, but the, the exile hasn't actually happened because Israel isn't redeemed. Look, they would say, look around. Do you see Israel being redeemed? Of course not. So the exile is still, um, uh, still something to happen. Dr. Wright says in one of his books, he says, this little group was the advance guard through whom the real exile would come about. Thus, the prophecies written before the exile, predicting the future return and restoration, were in fact starting to come true in the history of the group itself. The story of Israel had turned into the story of this group. So they are the ones that God is going to use to uh, bring about exile, because they're the righteous ones, of course. So Dr. Wright helpfully explains their beliefs through a, a series of questions, and uh, hopefully you find this, this helpful. If you were to ask the Essenes, so who are we? Who are we? They would say, well, we are the true Israel. We're the true Israel. We're the true Israel and the heirs of the promise. Promises that are ignored in the present, but with a great future before us. We, we are ignored in the present. No one notices us. We are ignored in the present, but we have a great future that is before us. So where are they? Well, they would say we are in exile, situated away from Israel, uh, demonstrating by our wilderness existence the fact that the promises of restoration and redemption are yet to be fulfilled. If you were to ask them, so what's wrong? What's wrong with the, the present situation? They would say Israel is clearly uh, not redeemed. The wrong people are in power. The wrong high priest is ruling the temple. And Israel as a whole is absolutely blind. <laughs> blind. So if you were to ask them, so, so what is the solution? They would say, well, Israel's God has begun to act. And in calling this movement into existence, 
he has prepared he has prepared the um can you still hear me okay can you hear me okay john are you able to hear me you are not clear your 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 network your your network seems to be low yeah let's see here uh, It says that the, my speaker is not working. Let's see. Uh, uh. Can you hear me now? Yes. You can hear me now? Mm -hmm. John, can you hear yes. me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. you know, I'm not sure what happened there. Okay, so so you can hear me then? Yes. Uh, Emily, yes. you can hear me? Okay. Okay. So um so I'll, I'll continue then. I'm just gonna Okay. Okay, I'll I'll continue then. So they would say, so if you were to ask them, so what's wrong? What's wrong? They would say, well, God's, Israel's God has begun to act in calling this movement into existence. And he's prepared the way for the final showdown between himself and his enemies. They would say, um, soon he will send his anointed ones, a priest and a king a priest and a king who will be Israel's rulers. And uh, he will lead the sons of light, which of course is us. Hello, he, what's happening? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, the network he, has gone blank. He will lead the sons of light in a great war against uh, the sons of darkness. And not only will the Gentiles, but also the renegade Jews, they will all be defeated. And the sons of light will reign for a thousand generations. Um, any, any questions about any of that so far? Any questions? No? Okay. So I want to talk a little bit then about uh, God had begun to act within history and their, and their understanding. So the sect looked forward to the eschaton, the eschaton. Now that's going to become an important word, the eschaton. Eschaton is last things, last things. So the word eschaton means last things. Uh, they looked forward to the eschaton when God would act within history to redeem his people and establish them as his people and restore a new temple, a new temple. The Essenes believed that they were the forerunners of all this. They even saw themselves as the new temple. Imagine, imagine, uh, the temple is where the presence of God is. And the Essenes would say, the presence of God is not in Jerusalem. Why? Because the temple is corrupt in Jerusalem. Is the presence of God still uh, in um, uh, still occurring? They would say, of course, he, the presence of God is uh, occurring. Where? In us. We are the new temple. If you want to know where the presence of God is, you look to our group because that's where um, his presence is. That's what they would say. This is because the temple is where the God of Israel we're currently met with his truly faithful people. And the Essenes, of course, thought that they were um, the only ones who were faithful. Now, also, they believed in predestination. Now, you've probably heard of that, that word, uh, predestination. Now, we have to understand predestination, though, in the way that they would have understood it. Uh, predestination it does not mean that they believed in a personal um, 
uh, predestination at the level of the individual. So their concept of predestination wasn't, a, wasn't pertaining to uh, the local individual. To, to think of predestination in the way that they understood it in those terms would be to make a, a huge mistake. Uh, they didn't think of predestination in terms of uh, at the local level. Uh, rather, for the Essenes, predestination pertained to Israel as a whole. God has, has predestined Israel as a whole. He's, we're not talking about the individual here. We're talking about the whole. God has predestined uh, Israel as a whole. And Israel was the elect people of, of the one true God, a reality now describing the Essenes because they were the true Israel. So we can't think of predestination in this sense at the, the individual level. Um, they perceived uh, predestination at a corporate level or a, a whole level. God has predestined Israel as a whole. And we are Israel. We are the true Israel. So we've been, we've been predestined to be the true Israel. And God is going to act through us because we are the ones in whom um, his, uh, his sovereign power is going to be uh, revealed. Now, the other important thing is that we're not talking about earning our salvation. That's not what they're about. Uh, they, had a keen, uh, they had a keen interest in angels, where the Sadducees dismissed the role of angels. The Essenes said, no, no, we believe in angels. They, 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 were, they had a keen interest in angels. But they did not commit, they did not perceive their commitment to purity and holiness as earning them salvation or earning them a membership within, um, uh, within the people of God. That's not how they understood it. Uh, they did practice purity laws and they did strive to be holy, at least in the way that they understood it. They were doing this to express their commitment to God. They weren't earning their salvation. They were expressing their commitment uh, to God. They also believed in that the soul was immortal, uh, that the soul did not die. Uh, they believed, they did believe in a um, earthly body that was corruptible. So this earthly body is corruptible and it is immortal. And um, so in this sense, their, their, their view is, is similar to the view that we read about in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul is talking about the importance of the resurrected uh, body. But uh, the difference is that, um, of course, in Paul, he's talking about the resurrected body that we will receive, a resurrected body that is the same as a resurrected body of Jesus. So, we, uh, so if you look at Philippians chapter uh, 3, uh, 20 to 21, for example, uh, you, you'll, you'll read about that. And so, in conclusion, although the Essenes were a small sect within Judaism, their views are helpful to compare to the teaching of the New Testament. For example, they believed in inaugurated. Inaugurated means begin. They believed in inaugurated eschatology. And so does the New Testament. They also believed in the necessity of anointed a priest and anointed king, but of course they they did not hold that these were the same same people. In contrast, as a long-awaited Messiah, Jesus is in fact both priest and king. So is Jesus both? Is he our high priest? Absolutely. Is he our king? Absolutely. Uh, he is he is the anointed. High priest. We read about that in the book of Hebrews. Uh, he is the one who entered into the, the Holy of Holies uh, to offer the Lamb to atone for our sins. But of course, astonishingly, uh, not only did he enter into the Holy of Holies to uh, offer uh, our, uh, a Lamb as the atoning sacrifice, he was the Lamb. He was the Lamb. So not only is he the high priest, who offers the lamb, he is the lamb that the, that the high priest offers. That is, there, there, there's a few sermons in that, definitely, without question. 
Um, also, the Essenes removed themselves from their society. In contrast, Jesus doesn't take us out of our society. He wants us to influence our society and, and um, uh, redeem our society through our, through our lives, through our uh, commitment, and through our faith in Jesus. Uh, the Essenes withdrew from society. Uh, as those who follow Jesus, we're not to withdraw from society. We're to be different from society. But we're not to withdraw from society. We are to um, try to influence society. So with that, the vision of, of Jesus is a lot more graceful, uh, a lot more heart, uh, hopeful. And for that, I think we should all uh, rejoice. Any any questions about anything that I've I've talked about? Any questions at all? John, any questions? The Essenes. Uh, uh, I actually find them fascinating. The uh, and I think some of the seeds of what we read about in the New Testament, we can see some of the seeds uh, in the Essenes. Of course, they had a they had an incomplete and oftentimes a, a very distorted understanding of certain things. But you can, I can see where some of those ideas, not all of them, some of them were horrible ideas, <laughs> but some of them were sort of the, the forerunners of things that we read about in the New Testament. Um, and and they're, 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 you can see the, the influence of those ideas, I think, uh, in, in the ways that I, that I mentioned. Any questions? Um, yeah, go ahead. I, I have uh, something I wanted to find out. Huh? Yes. The, the, there is a group that uh, we're kind of, I'm not seeing where we're touching on them, the Zealots. Yes, yes, the Zealots. Now, um, we, we are not touching on them, but I wish we could, Armstrong. They are also fascinating. Yeah. You've got a, the Zealots. The Zealots were, they absolutely hated the Romans. And uh, every chance we get to to uh, to kill a Roman, yeah, we will. We will. They were extremely violent, and they were extremely committed to the cause. Um, it's quite possible. In fact, I I would say almost almost certain. In Luke's gospel, you have Jesus hanging on the cross, and you have two thieves on either side. Not thieves in the sense of people who steal things. Uh, more like guerrilla warfare people. Um, I think it's quite possible that they were zealots. That's and they and they got caught by the Romans, and, and so they're hanging on on either side of the cross uh, of Jesus. The zealots were people; they were absolutely committed to the cause, and um, their solution was: we we got to take out as many Romans as we can, Armstrong. And if we get a chance, so the, we will. Simon, Simon Peter was a zealot, eh? S sorry? Simon Peter. Um, I think Simon he had... Simon Peter was a zealot. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about that. Uh, uh, but there was Simon the Zealot. There was Simon, Simon the, zealot. the Zealot. sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, so, so now that is... I mean, that's a story in, it, in and of itself. Uh, so you've got Simon Peter... And then you have Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot. Yes. Now, typical for Jesus. Armstrong, if you were going to choose 12 people to be your, your group that follows you, there are two people that you would not put in the same group. You would not put Simon the Zealot with Matthew <laughs> the tax collector. You, you would not do that. Uh, Matthew collaborated with the Romans. He collected taxes for the Romans. He, he was in their hip pocket, so to speak. Simon the Zealot, he hates the Romans. And he hates <laughs> everyone who uh, works for the, for the Romans. Would Simon the Zealot despise Matthew the tax collector? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and Jesus has him in the same group. So can you imagine Armstrong, or those three years that they're following Jesus, 
Do you think that there were uh, sparks between Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector? I think it's almost guaranteed. Uh, <laughs> I mean, talk about talk about enemies. You've got and Jesus purposely chooses both of them to be in his his uh, his group. I I find that astonishing. Armstrong, you and I, we, we I wouldn't do that. I, I would not <laughs> I do that. It, I, would, I, wouldn't I, wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Uh, you're going to have, talk about uh, animosity. And, and, and uh, they can't stand one another. They're on, they're on either side of the, um, uh, of the spectrum. And Jesus has them in the same group. Uh, it, it, in, one, in one sense, you'd, you'd say, that's crazy. But I think there's a reason why Jesus chose both of them. You've got these two enemies in the same group. There's got to be a message you, in that. If you are a king, if you are a king, definitely you have to be sure that you have authority over each and every aspect of their lives. <laughs> yes. And yes. you have to put them down under control. Yes. Yes. You have to change their lives and make them be different. And I think as a king, you manage. Uh, absolutely. Um, boy, I, 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 could, I could just imagine the, uh, the conversations between Matthew and Simon the Zealot. So, yeah, we're not going to talk a lot about the, we're not going to talk about the Zealots, but they're another group. They're another group. And um, uh, they're pretty radical. They're pretty radical. And they're definitely committed to violence. Um, I, th I personally think the, the, the two thieves on the cross I think they were zealots. Um, yes, but actually, even if you, if you see how it ends, if you see how it ends, uh, the zealot um, revolt, how it ends in uh, in uh, Masada, mm -hmm. they, yes. they, they commit they, 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 they commit suicide, and you know, yes, they were yes. not able, yes. the, the Romans could not be able to get hold of them. They just committed suicide. That's right. That's right. Because the the Jews are not. I mean, the one thing for the Jews, there, with there is exceptions, but they're they're tenacious. We we are we are not going to do um, anything that violates our uh, our view of the Torah or our view of, of our religion. We will we will literally die before we'll do that. Thank you. And and, and they and they did and they did. Yeah yeah good Thanks. good points. Um, uh, it, it's interesting that even with um, so you got the two thieves on either side of Jesus, but you also have Barabbas. Barabbas, mm -hmm. who was released, uh, was Barabbas a zealot? I think so. I think so. I think so. Uh, that he was caught by Rome. Uh, if Rome catches a zealot, yeah, you're you're dead. They will they will kill you. Uh, they don't. Rome does not put up with zealots. That's why they would do everything in secret. Um, if you're going to kill a Roman, you better do it in secret because. Uh, and they and they did they did so th those are the zealots yeah uh, unfortunately we don't have time to, to really uh, but but yeah another fascinating group uh, Armstrong yeah any other Thank questions you. about any of that I, I'm conscious of the time and I'm I'm trying to um, honor the the time here but I, I do want to talk about Jewish eschatology because um, this is this is very important and I and I would say this is uh, uh, this helps us to understand some of the things that Jesus um, spoke about. Any, any, any questions though before I go on? Any any concerns? Any thoughts? Comments? Uh, basically, everything that I'm, I'm saying is in the notes. So. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. And, and uh, as I mentioned, I am recording this, and so I will send the recording uh, to Fred, and then he can send them on to you as well. So Thank you. Jewish. Thank you. Jewish eschatology. Eschatology is about the last things. And the focus of study brings us face to face with the ancient concepts of, of death and resurrection and how they, there was a great variety uh, among them. Now, it's interesting that... Uh, I have a couple of quotes here. And hopefully it'll show you the, the range of, of understanding of death and resurrection. So from the Greek theater, 
think, consider this view. This is, a, this is something that was said in the Greek theater. Once a man has died and, and the dust has soaked up his blood, there is, that should be no, there is no resurrection. No resurrection. This view considers death to be permanent and resurrection is a non-starter. So for the Greek-minded person, uh, when you die, that's it. It's permanent. And there is no resurrection. Resurrection is a non-starter. Non now, in contrast, consider this quote. While the uh, pyra was burning, it is said that a cloud passed under Hercules and with a peal of thunder wafted him up to heaven. That's a quote. This view of death shaped the Roman tradition that emperors were received at death into heaven and translated into celestial beings, uh, uh, divinized, if not fully divine. So heroes get transported into heaven without dying. That's a, that's a Roman view. So if you're, if you're an emperor and if you're a hero, uh, you don't actually die. You just get transferred into, into heaven. Now, Consider one more of the ancient views. This is a, a, a typical Jewish understanding. Consider this. You cursed wretch. You dismiss us from this present life. But the king of the universe will raise us up to an everlasting renewal of life because we have died for his laws. This is a quote from uh, 2 Maccabees 7 9. And it was uttered by a Jewish youth who refused to eat the unclean food of the pagans during the Maccabean uh, revolt. So picture this young uh, Jewish youth, and he's been forced to eat unclean food by uh, Antiochus and his, and his soldiers. And this young uh, Jewish youth says, there is not a chance I am not eating that food. And in response, he says, you cursed wretch. He's talking to the soldier that's going to kill him. You, you, you cursed wretch. You dismiss us from this present life. But the king of the universe will raise us up. See, raise us up to everlasting renewal of life. Because we have died for the law. That is a totally different understanding of death. In this last view, the faithful person is rewarded and will return back to life. That was their view. This view provides us with an example of the eschatological uh, hopes of the ancient Jews. Uh, any, any questions about that so far? Any questions? No? Okay. So here are some common characteristics of uh, Jewish eschatology. Eschatology is just a, a fancy word that means the study of the last, the last thing. And so uh, Dr. Nokovic in, our, in our, our textbook helpfully describes many of the variations within uh, early or among the early Jews regarding eschatology. But she also reminds us that there are common characteristics even within the variation. So she states, these common characteristics included a qualitative difference between the present and the future. There's gonna be a difference between what we presently see and what we hope for in the future. There's a qualitative difference between uh, the present and the future. The coming age will be marked by a universal permanent eradication of evil and the cosmic eternal sovereignty of God. So in Jewish eschatology, there's all kinds of variations, but these are the things that they agree on. There's going to be diff a difference between the present and the future. And one of the major differences is that there's going to be this universal permanent eradication, a removal of, of evil. And the cosmic and eternal sovereignty of God will be exercised. 
that was a um, common characteristic among uh, the Jews. In the eschatology of the Jews, uh, major changes were forthcoming. God would make all things right by removing evil and establishing his sovereignty over this, this new age that was, a, was about to, that they were waiting to happen. Uh, God is going to ish, usher in a, a new age. And when he ushers in this new age, all things are going to be made right. Uh, evil is going to be removed. He is going to be absolutely sovereign in every way. And we are going to be, we're going to see his sovereignty uh, in obvious uh, permanent uh, ways. This would prevent any reversal back to the sinful state of the present world. We are living in a sinful state now. There's going to be a day when God's going to usher in, to the, usher in a, a, the age to come. And when that happens, we're not going to be going back to any um, context where sinful um, actions and ways are going to be present. For many, this new age included the restoration of national Israel, national Israel. And in some variations, the subjugation and even the expulsion of the, the Gentiles. So as we noted from the Jewish youth in uh, 2 Maccabees, that even though the world would, even though he would die, and he did die, he was about to die, and he knew he's going to die, he believed that there would be a day of justice and vindication because he had kept the law and God would vindicate him for being faithful and, and maintaining the law. And he expected to return to life uh, in this new coming age. Any, any questions about any of that so far? Anything that I've said that raises questions or comments or? Okay. Still crystal clear. Amazing. That's it is. It is. <laughs> just take it home. Question. Sorry. Just, just take it home. Okay. Okay. So, um, the uh, I want to talk about the general resurrection. So the the Jews believed in life after death, for those who remain committed to God. If if you remain committed to God. There is life after death for you in, in the Jewish understanding. But in the ancient world, and this is, this is, this is really important, and this is where there's a, a real difference between uh, more, I would consider, um, uh, evangelical view of, of, of the scriptures and, and the resurrection in comparison uh, to a more liberal understanding of the resurrection. In, uh, this is very important. In the ancient world, the word resurrection the word resurrection is not a metaphor and it doesn't merely describe the spiritual uh, that is not what the word meant in the ancient world uh, in the ancient world when they used the word resurrection they meant bodily resurrection it involved the, the physical body in some fashion so for example uh, we see this reflected in the the greek a theater play, the quote that I mentioned earlier. They dismissed the resurrection. The resurrection was a non-starter for them. But it doesn't mean that the Greeks and the other cultures within the ancient world didn't believe in some form of afterlife. They did. So they, they believed that there was going to be an afterlife. But it did not involve any form of resurrection. And it certainly didn't involve um, the, a bodily resurrection. That, that's not how they understood it. There, were, there was an afterlife but it didn't involve the resurrection or any bodily resurrection. Uh, the existence in the afterlife did not involve any notion of resurrection uh, to the Greeks. And you can see that in the quote that I offered um, at the beginning. This is because the concept of the resurrection in the ancient world would always include the body. That is extremely important. In the New Testament, some people would say that the, the concept of a resurrection is only in reference to some spiritual resurrection, that it doesn't involve the body. That is nonsense. It always involved the body because the word resurrection always was associated with, with the body in the ancient world. There's no examples 
of the word resurrection being used in any fashion other than in reference to the body in, in the ancient world. Uh, following uh, Plato's hope, many of the ancients wanted the soul to escape the body uh, permanently after death. They thought that the body was, was, was bad. They thought that the soul was entrapped in the body. We don't want to retain any form of the body. We want to get rid of the body. And so uh, there were as many within the ancient world that held to this hope that was um, articulated famously by Plato that the, the, we don't want the body to be uh, resurrected. We want the soul to escape the body. But to, um, in, in their mind, desire to include the body in the afterlife this is the Greek understanding. Uh, to include the body in the afterlife life to them was sheer nonsense. That is just a non-starter. That's not what they that's not what they believed, and that's not what they wanted. Therefore, a non-bodily resurrection in the eschaton was inconceivable. Um, uh, therefore, a, a non-bodily resurrection in the ex, in the eschaton was inconceivable. Um, that should have been I said non-bodily. It should be bodily. For a Greek-minded person, uh, it shouldn't it shouldn't say non-bodily. It should say, therefore, a bodily resurrection in the eschaton was inconceivable, uh, inconceivable to many of the ancients. Now, in contrast, except for the Sadducees, we saw that uh, uh, a few moments ago. They didn't believe, of course, in the resurrection. But except for the Sadducees, uh, the Pharisees uh, and the Essenes, they all believed in a a bodily resurrection of some form. As Dr. Wright says, resurrection was never simply a way of speaking about life after death. It was one particular story that was told about the dead, a story in which the present state of those who had died would be replaced by a future state in which they would be alive once more. He says resurrection was more specifically uh, not the redefinition or redescription of death, a way of giving a positive interpretation to the fact that the breath and blood of a human body had ceased to function, leading quickly to corruption and decay, but the reversal or undoing or defeat of death, restoring to some kind of bodily life. That's the point. That's the point. To some kind of bodily life, those who had passed through the first stage. And the italics are his. In other words, in a Jewish understanding, in their eschatolog eschatological hope, the resurrection always involved the body in some fashion because the, the word resurrection was always associated with the body. A non bodily resurrection was inconceivable to the Jews and it was undesirable uh, for uh, the Greeks and the Romans. So the resurrection involved the restoration of the body in the future after one dies. However, the Jews believed this eschatological hope of resurrection would happen at the end of history. That's important. At the end of history, when God establishes the coming age. Now, we see this understanding of the resurrection and the eschatological hope with Martha uh, in her interaction with Jesus in John chapter 11. This is one of my, my favorite stories. I, 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 I sympathize with Martha. Uh, her brother has just died, Lazarus, and he's been dead for four days. And Jesus seems to diddle dolly uh, getting to Jerusalem or, or to Bethany. He, he, uh, he seems to take his time. He takes four days to get there. And Martha sees Jesus coming and she runs out to greet him. Now that was unheard of. Uh, uh, a woman in mourning was not supposed to run out and, and, and greet the, uh, the, the coming um, teacher, but she does. She's distraught. Of course she's distraught. Her brother has just died. And, and she knows that if, if Jesus had been there, um, he wouldn't have died. And I think that Martha was a little ticked off at, at Jesus because he wasn't there. And so she goes out and she, she has this, this uh, famous interaction with Jesus. And, and Jesus speaks to her in a, in a cryptic kind of a way uh, about... Um, how there's going to be a new concept of resurrection. And there's going to be a new um, life that will uh, be possible. 
And it's all, of course, because of him. So, for example, uh, this is the part that I find astonishing. Jesus said, this is from John chapter 11, 23 to 26. So Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Did she believe in a general resurrection? Of course. Of course. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who, believe, who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then she asked Martha, do you believe this? Now, that is a cryptic way of describing what is about to occur uh, through the resurrection, but in the person of Jesus. He's redefining uh, resurrection, and he's stating that this resurrection that we, you, you hope for is found in me. I am the resurrection, and I am the one who will give you the new life that, that you need. He, Jesus came to change the hope and the hope of resurrection, and the life it involves through belief in him now. This, in turn, radically changes how you, uh, how you and I should both live in the present. Uh, read Colossians chapter 3. Since you've been raised with Christ, set your mind on things above. That's present tense. Since you've been raised with Christ. Because you've been raised with Christ. So, so Emily had, in, in some some uh, amazing way. H have you been raised with Christ? Absolutely. In the present, you are raised with Christ right now. Uh, since you've been raised with Christ, set your mind on things above. Now, there's going to be a day when you're going to experience all the, the fullness and the, the culmination of what that means. But, but you've been raised with Christ as we speak. Since you've been raised with Christ, that's present tense. That's all because of what Jesus uh, did and what he offers. Now, here's the important part. The Jews thought that the eschaton was going to happen at the end of time, at the end of, uh, the, uh, of everything, at the end of history. So they thought that there was going to be a resurrection. And those that were committed to God, they were going to be raised bodily to uh, some uh, new life, bodily. But that was going to happen at the end of history. Uh, but Jesus said, comes along and uh, the, the resurrection begins in the middle of history, not at the end, in the middle. And it did. It did. So Paul argues, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the, uh, the absolute crux of our faith. If you remove the resurrection and the importance of the resurrection of Jesus, you've just cut the heart out of our faith. The resurrection is everything. Everything stands and falls on the resurrection. The cross is vital. But the cross um, gets its power and its significance because of the resurrection. God vindicated Jesus on the cross. How? By raising him from the dead. The resurrection is the crux of our faith. And because Jesus was raised on the third day bodily, he has launched the, the new life, the new creation now. The new, the new age has already started, and it will be brought to completion when he returns, but, but it's already started. The new age has started now. The eschaton did not happen at the end of history. The eschaton has begun in the middle of history, in the person and through the, the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, that is astonishing, and that is something that as Christians uh, we, we hold to. That is that is absolutely crucial to our understanding. Uh, it began, uh, and, and, and the surprising thing is that Jesus uh, began this, uh, he was the Messiah. The word Christ means Messiah. Uh, he was the one who um, inaugurated or, 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 or began uh, this new life, the, the new age, the, the, the new beginning has already started. But he was the, the, a suffering servant uh, that initiated that and made that happen. That's an oxymoron. It's an oxymoron for the Jews. Uh, 
They were waiting for a Messiah. But the Messiah does not suffer. You don't have a, a, a suffering Messiah. The Messiah conquers. He doesn't suffer. And, and uh, it was as bewildering to them as it is still to many of us. Uh, you have someone who came and who, who died. And he is the one who established the eschaton, the end. The end of history has already started, has already begun in the middle of history. That, that, that's, that's amazing. And it, and it, was, it, it was accomplished by a suffering servant, Isaiah 53. So as Dr. Nokovich uh, clearly shows, uh, not all the eschatological hopes of the Jews included a Messiah. Some, some did, uh, some didn't. Some had a, a figure who would be either, uh, they were a priest or a, a prophet or maybe a king uh, or an angel, a chief angel perhaps, maybe even, even God himself, but not an anointed uh, eschatological redeemer who is actually called a Messiah in much of the ancient scripture. So um, there are some, there are some, not all of them were expecting the Messiah and they certainly we're not expecting the Messiah in the way that Jesus uh, is uh, portrayed uh, in the New Testament. Some, some of the Jews even envision the coming of two Messiahs, two Messiahs. So there's going to be a priest Messiah, uh, a, a Messiah of Aaron. So someone asked earlier, but, uh, you know, it was the high priest uh, uh, from the lineage of, of Aaron. Uh, some of the, uh, the groups said, absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's what, that's what, uh, uh, validates whether a person can be a high priest. But this high priest is going to be the Messiah. He's going to be the one who liberates us. Uh, and he's going to be a priest. Uh, some of them uh, thought that there was going to be two. There was going to be a priest Messiah and there was going to be a king Messiah. Uh, uh, so a priest, so there's going to be two Messiahs. One is a priest and one is a king. And uh, the king would be the, the Messiah of, of, of Israel. But none of the, uh, none of the Jewish uh, hopes for the eschatological um, uh, Messiah uh, ever included a suffering servant. That is just a, that, that's, that's crazy. That's crazy. Uh, messiahs don't suffer. Messiahs conquer. In the minds of the Jews, uh, we want a conquering Messiah. We don't want a suffering Messiah. A suffering servant, that's not what we need. We need a, a, a military uh, a conquering Messiah. A suffering servant suggests weakness and an inability to conquer Israel's enemies. A, a suffering servant displays the, the opposite of strength, a quality many believed the Messiah requires. But Jesus is the Messiah. He is the suffering servant as depicted in Isaiah 53. Th this Messiah suffered because he allowed the wrath of man and the evil schemes of, of, of man to be unleashed upon him and even kill him. He, he did this so that death could crush him, not because of his iniquities, but because of our iniquities. He did all of this to allow God to condemn our sins, our sins that God placed upon him, not his sins, our sins. The wages of sin is death. Whose wages of sin did Jesus die for? He did not die for the wages of his own sin. He died for the wages of your sin and my sin. He allowed, he, he welcomed God to place our sins upon himself and he suffered in our place. And why did he do that? He did it to defeat our enemy. He did it to receive the wages of sin, but not his sin, but our sin, as I mentioned. He did this to defeat our greatest enemy, and our greatest enemy is death. Uh, he defeated our enemy. He, he, this uh, a defeat that was stamped with victory. How do we know that Jesus conquered our greatest enemy? How do we know that Jesus is the ultimate Messiah that we need? How do we know that he crushed, he was crushed and defeated our enemies? The reason 
that we can say that with absolute confidence is because of the resurrection in the empty tomb. He was a suffering servant and he suffered by allowing my sin and your sin to crush him. And he did all of that because of his grace and mercy and of course his love. And so when we come to Jesus, his resurrection means that the, the life of the age to come has begun for those who have put their faith in, in Jesus. Uh, this new life in the present extends on the other side of the grave. However, this hope demands a bodily resurrection where we live in the new heaven and the new earth, living in this, this new creation with a resurrected body is the aim. That's the goal, is to live in this transformed new creation with resurrected bodies, uh, bodies that look like the body of, of the resurrected Jesus. That's the aim and that's the goal. The Jews' eschatological hopes provided the seeds for the full and complete picture we see in the New Testament. However, this future eschatological hope for Christians centers on and around Jesus. Also, as a long-awaited Messiah, Jesus is in fact both priest and king. He is an anointed high priest who entered into the Holy of Holies to offer the Lamb to atone for our sins. But astonishingly, he was also the sacrificial lamb that was offered. Along with being our high priest, Jesus is also the king of kings. Therefore, the, the eschatological hope he provides begins now, even as we anticipate with confidence, because of his resurrection, a future where all things will be made right. Are there any questions? Any questions? It's Emily? becoming tough now. Sorry? <laughs> what, what's it's that? becoming tough. Tough, yeah. In, in what sense? In what sense? Uh, the, the, the eschatological, mm, yeah. 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 So, so as Christians, do we have eschatological hopes? Of course, of course. But, but, but our hopes are, are grounded in the resurrection of Jesus. Everything, uh, Paul, Paul was absolutely correct. In 1 Corinthians 15, everything stands and falls on the resurrection. If the resurrection didn't happen, we are, we are to be pitied more than any other people. We are futile in our thinking and we are, we are deceived beyond measure. But because of the resurrection, uh, the hope that we have, Emily, is um, we can be confident, absolutely confident in the, in the eschatological uh, hope that we have. There will be a day when this earth will be transformed and it, it will be the way it was supposed to be. And as a Christian, you will live on that earth. And you will live on that earth with a resurrected body, just like the resurrected body of Jesus. And all things will be made right. Does, does, that, does that inspire you? <laughs> yeah. And the question is, Yes. This, uh, maybe if you can make it clear yes. by the verse you started with, if you be risen with Christ, look at the things that are above yes and jesus tells mother he tells mother he is the resurrection yes so in christ we have re a resurrection yes and also we are waiting for a resurrection can absolutely. you make it somehow Abs clear absolutely so yeah. so so uh one of the things that in order to understand the uh, the new testament there there are times when there seems to be a blatant contradictions right it seems to be a blatant contradiction they're not contradictions what one of the things that we we need to uh, um, appreciate Rosabella is uh, there's a little phrase you don't you don't find this phrase in the New Testament but it's a phrase that will help put everything into perspective 
And, and here's the phrase. The already, not yet. Okay? Already, okay. not yet. Not yet. Mm. Already, not yet. Not so, for an example, we see this even in the passage that I reference. So, Colossians chapter, chapter 3. Let me read to you verses 1 to 4. Okay? If then you've been raised with Christ, it's, I, I like the NIV here. I'm, I'm reading from the ESV, but the NIV I think is even better. Since you've been raised with Christ. If, if then you've been raised with Christ, that's present tense. Present tense. That's the already. So he's writing to Christians at Colossae. And he's saying to Christians, since you've been raised with Christ. That's present tense. So there's the already. Since you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. And what are those things? Well, it, it's where is above? Well, it's where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind. So, so how, do you, um, how do you seek the things above? You seek the things above by setting your minds on things above. It's all about the mind. Set your mind on things above. Not on things that are, are on earth. There's the, the already. You're, you're, you're already raised with Christ. Now, seek the things that are above. I.e., set your mind on things above. For you have died... He's writing, to, he's writing to Christians. The people that he's writing to haven't died. But, but he's saying, yes, you have. Yes, you have. You've died to the old way. You've died to the old way. For you have died and your life is hidden uh, with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, there's the not yet. There's the not yet. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You have the already, the not yet. You're already raised with Christ. So, so Rosabella, as, as, a, as a, uh, someone who has put their faith in Jesus Christ, uh, are, you, um, are, you, um, are you raised with Christ right now? Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's, that's present tense. Mm -hmm. Since you've been raised with Christ, yes. that's the already. Mm -hmm. But there's still a, a, a day that's not yet. And, and when mm -hmm. Jesus returns, the not yet will be fully consummated, okay. uh, culminated. Already, not yet. Now, that okay. little phrase, that little phrase, which is not in the New Testament. So this is not a New Testament phrase. But that little phrase, uh, Rosabella, will, will help you to understand the New Testament. Already, not yet. Uh, the kingdom of God, is it already here? Absolutely. It's already, but it's not yet. Uh, we don't see the kingdom of God in all of its fullness, but is it already here? Absolutely. Every time God's will is done, uh, mm -hmm. the kingdom is, is present. The already, not yet. Um, the same with... Um, uh, you are already righteous. So, Rosabella, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, uh, yes. were you declared righteous? Absolutely. You're already righteous. Yeah. But, not, but not yet mm -hmm. complete. Because we still struggle with um, our, our, our fleshly natures and all those yes. kinds of things. The already not yet mm -hmm. is what makes sense of the New Testament. Sometimes people read these things and think, the, uh, the Apostle Paul was contradicting himself. He was not contradicting mm -hmm. himself. He understood that, that in principle, all these things have already started. And there will be a day when they will be brought to uh, completion. So has a new life already begun for those who are in Christ? Absolutely. Has it been completely um, uh, fulfilled in all of its fullness? No, not yet. Already. Not yet. Um, that's why he says in 2 Corinthians, um, you are new creatures in Christ Jesus. So, so, Rosabella, right now, you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Yeah. That's what it says. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. 
you and I are still working out what that looks like in real life because there are times when I don't live like I should live. I mean, I, I struggle with the power of sin as much as, uh, as you do. But, but has a new life already mm -hmm. started? Absolutely. That, that, yes. that, that's what it says. Mm -hmm. So the already, not yet. Does that make any sense? Very much. Yeah. yeah. This, this is God it right. Yeah. This is the good news. Mm -hmm. This is the good news. So you can think of all of the great mm -hmm. themes in the New Testament: righteousness, holiness, kingdom of God. Um, I mean, you see it in the kingdom of God all through the gospels. There's times when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God being a, a present reality. The kingdom is the kingdom is now fulfilled. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It, it's it's a present reality, but there's also a future reality that is going to be fully realized in in all of its fullness. That's glorious stuff. I'm sorry. I, I, sometimes I get preaching you see instead of lecturing, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good news. It's good. It's good news. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or comments about any of this? No? All crystal clear. My goodness. Yeah. Joseph. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mine may not be really a direct question on uh, what we're doing today, but it touches just on eschatology as, as revealed in the book of Revelation. Yes. <laughs> uh, we, have, we have somebody who is teaching around here. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the two witnesses, the Bible talks about the two, yeah. sub, two witnesses in the book of Revelation. Yes, yes. Uh, that, uh, this, that these two witnesses, there are those who say this, one will be Enoch and another one will be Elijah. Yes. That these people have to test death before they can be, you know, before they, they can be translated to face judgment. Because the Bible says it's appointed for one to die yes. and then judgment. And then they're saying because these people did not, uh, did not test death, they have to die first. So they, we have that group of people who are saying Enoch and Elijah. Yes. But we also have of course, a local prophet who is also saying he's, a, he's the two witness. He's a, he's a two witness. So <laughs> really? really confusing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I highly doubt that. I, hi, I highly doubt that, Joseph. Uh, I could I could see where I I would say that is a very um, a twisted understanding of of that chapter in Revelation. Mm. Revel, Revel, I I would love to teach you guys about Revelation. Revelation is an amazing book, but you have mm. to read it very carefully. It's very uh, John does not speak in words; he speaks in pictures, pictures, mm -hmm. pictures. Mm -hmm. And the pictures that he is uh, drawing from uh, for us are uh, mostly from the Old Testament. So, so, so he's he's saying that that um, uh, these these witnesses are witnessing to to Jesus, uh, but that's a picture. That's a picture uh, to. I, I I would say that 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 the, your your man who says that he's the uh, was, was, was the, I, I would say that is really misguided. It, it, with all due respect, with all due respect, I would say that's very yeah. misguided. Um, you yeah. have, we have to read, the book of Revelation uh, is a powerful book. And, it, and it's a book that we should, we should study. But we have to set it within its historical context. There's a, he was writing to seven churches in seven cities. Yeah. Real, real people, Joseph. Real people, and yes. and he's writing within the context of their, uh, their, um, their context. Uh, uh, one of the things that uh, Fred has asked me to consider doing is maybe, maybe in the fall teaching a course on, um, uh, on how to read the New Testament, mm -hmm. and uh, or or the the scriptures, the scriptures. And so one of one of my uh, lectures is on the book of Revelation, 
Mm -hmm. And um, it's highly, first of all, it's highly symbolic. There's lots mm -hmm. of symbols mm -hmm. in the book of Revelation. And mm -hmm. so to take those, to take those uh, symbols and, and, and pictures and apply them to directly to a, uh, uh, a current or, or, or um, a current person, is highly questionable highly mm -hmm. questionable. so i don't know if i've answered your question or not but uh uh mm -hmm. i would well put it this way um mm -hmm. the, the the man who says that he is the uh the the, the witness i would is I would, two in one sorry in, is two witnesses in one yes two witnesses mm -hmm. in one <laughs> I would be highly, highly suspicious. Highly mm. suspicious. Does mm. he point people to Jesus? Yes. yes. He talks about Jesus so much. Yes. But and, does, believe... and does he encourage? Yeah. Does he encourage people to to live their lives to, for the glory of, of of Jesus? Yeah. He asks people to repent. Okay. And and, mm. and uh, does he? Um, uh <clears throat> does he uh encourage meekness <laughs> what about love no, what about love no, no. love yes but you know i think it is just a question of uh maybe somebody just misses a mark somewhere mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because uh, he strongly believes and actually teaches his ad uh, adherence that uh, is, he will go to Jerusalem and die. He will be, you know, he will be the two witnesses. So he says he's, he's, he's one, but in two, or something like that. Yes, yes. Two, two in one, or something like that. I, I, would, um, I would be highly suspicious, to be honest. Um, I, would, I would want to examine the fruit. You'll mm -hmm. know the tree by its fruit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I don't know this man. I, 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 I'm, I'm in no position to, uh, to evaluate the fruit, but I would be highly suspicious, highly suspicious. Um, He's uh, just a world figure. He preaches even, he comes even, uh, he goes to U.S., he goes to many of these countries. Yes. Maybe, um, maybe you have some knowledge. He's a prophet. He's, well, and I, and, I, I, and I believe that there are prophets. So I'm not just, uh, I do believe that there are prophets. Um, but pro, but prophets, uh, prophets can be, um, uh, they can be misguided as well. So that's a, I, 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 I'm interested. I, I would like to do some, uh, uh, learn more about him. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you could say, Maybe you could send me his name, uh, Joseph. I, I would be interested in learning about him. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll send you. Yeah, it's okay. I'll ask. I'll ask Armstrong to do it. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I would be interested. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Thank I, you. Know, I know what you're talking about, so it's okay. Yes. Any Any other questions uh, for me? No, no, crystal clear. That's good. That's good. We okay? All right, all right. Well, I'll leave it at that then. And um, if you, um, uh, so I guess we're meeting. I guess we're 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 going to be doing a new class next next week. Uh, and I will, I will get the information out to you. Um, is there any questions about the assignments? Any questions? <laughs> So, so what I will do is um, I will try to um, uh, I, I believe that I believe that I've been recording uh, this um, these lectures and I will try to send them to to, to Fred and uh, um, hopefully that uh, that might be beneficial to you and and um, most of what I've said are all it's all in the notes there it's all in the, the PowerPoint presentation that I sent you so um, that that should help you in uh, in writing your uh, your papers so
Okay, well, uh, Joseph, would you close us in prayer? Would you Would you pray for us? It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we pray. Uh, everlasting Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for the lesson that you have had today. We thank you for our professor. We thank you for the knowledge that you have given unto him. And we thank you for the divine connection that you have had, O oh God. I thank you for each and every student who has attended the, the lectures today. I pray and I decree, Lord, that our lives have been transformed and that, Lord, we are getting better and better even as we move towards the end of our lessons. Father, we give you glory and honor. We pray, Lord of glory, that even as we depart, let your presence be with us. Give us the wisdom even to, uh, to finish the assignment in time. We bless you and we give you glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we believe and pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Amen. You're welcome. God bless. God bless. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Enjoy your lunch. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>